to welcome everybody to the last presentation in this spring or spring quarter, spring quarter, winter quarter actually. I'm, I'm already ahead of schedule and I'm super happy that we have um, Dr. Lilia Hogebaum here today, who is a author, consultant, entrepreneur, and also happens to be an ETM adjunct faculty. Um, and Dr. Anderson will introduce her. Thank okay. You. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Yetter. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, our final speaker of the uh, winter term uh, distinguished speaker series. Uh, this is a great opportunity to hear um, uh, 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 talks about healthcare. I want to highlight um, Dr. Hogebaum is an adjunct professor at the Portland State University Engineering and Technology Management Department. She's an author, consultant, and lecturer in the fields of economics and management, as well as healthcare assessment, decision making, and artificial intelligence. She has over 20 years of experience in analytics and research holding several MS degrees in uh, economics and management, as well as a PhD in technology management. She has 10 years of entrepreneurial experience running a software services consulting company, Nascentia Corporation, and has a number of publications in peer reviewed journals like Health Policy and Technology, Energy Technology and Policy, Foresight and others. She's also co-authored a book on healthcare technology innovation adoption. This is a, a critical topic area as we're looking at issues of uh, healthcare in this are uh, year one of, of uh, and moving into year two of COVID um, and dealing with uh, the rollout, the diffusion of innovations, the diffusion of treatments. And so we've seen uh, all kinds of things that we've been living through excellent and timely subject. Also, it's very timely in that just a couple days ago was national or international um, um, uh, engineering women's day. And this year, this spring term for the very first time, half of the ETM graduate programs will be taught by women engineers and so um, and women engineering faculty. So we have Dr. Yetter, we have Dr. Hogebaum and Dr. Judith Estep uh, will all be teaching classes for us this uh, spring term. Highly recommended, Dr. Hogebaum is gonna be teaching advanced engineering economics we welcome people from all different disciplines that are moving into roles of managing technology-based organizations to the ETM department for classes such as that or the project management class with uh, Dr. Estep. Feel free to reach out to any of our speakers to, uh, or participants today of Dr. Hugabom, Dr. Yetter, myself, Dr. Debob, and we'd be happy to share more information on this. So please feel free to uh, join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Hugabom. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Yetter. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be the speaker. And um, uh, also, I'm excited to um, be teaching the advanced engineering economics class. Um, uh, the class already has, I think, uh, around 18 students or so. Uh, so um, it should be a fun uh, spring term. Um, so in um, in winter of, uh, well, um, this uh, last year has been quite interesting for everybody. And um, I've uh, prepared um, just um, certain small sh uh, snapshots and case studies of things that actually happened only recently. Uh, and also um, building up on um, uh, and analytics and um, predictions of uh, things done in the past and how that translated over. So I hope, um, Hope you'll be uh, um, sort of entertained. If not, um, hope it'll be an informative experience. So um, let's begin. Um, so my topic for today is uh, advancements and challenges in healthcare data analytics applications. Um, so this is a, a small uh, snapshot of the healthcare innovations growth. So unlike uh, what's um, happening in many industries, 
uh, due to uh, pandemic, actually uh, health innovations experienced the boost uh, because of the uh, lots of investments funding um, thrown into the sectors of telemedicine and uh, remote patient monitoring. So um, in, in a way, um, well, uh, for others, it may be um, 2020 would also was the year of downturn. This uh, year for healthcare innovations was a um, historic year because uh, the funding uh, grew 55% more than um, in 2019 and also um, more than 2018. Um, and uh, with that, um, there have been uh, sort of shifting priorities in the industry. Uh, investments um, grew um, um, sort of the um, proportionally to the um, uh, the depth of the um, uh, healthcare um, innovation um, priorities. So in the way um, in um, telemedicine uh, field, um, for example, uh, Teladoc uh, teamed up with the Livongo company, and um, that um, improved, I, I hope, um, extended the field of chronic care, um, uh, matched with the platform um, of the telemedicine. Lots of companies also did vertical integration. For example, Walmart and CareZone and United Health Group did that too. And um, according to um, certain reports, the uh, uh, big analytical reports of Startup Health and others, um, the most uh, funded categories were um, access to care. Um, they, um, approximately $9 billion um, dollars invested. Uh, cost to zero, so there were um, uh, investments in uh, uh, technologies for reducing costs and disease cure and preve prevention. Um, some, the nice thing was that um, women's health got um, high investment uh, growth, uh, but um, brain health, um, longevity, and children's health um, actually um, had reduced uh, investments because of that shift to um, telemedicine and uh, remote patient monitoring. Um, in uh, digital health funding, which is um, uh, the a category that um, the group Rock Health uh, um, is uh, following, the investments um, grew as well in um, 2020, and um, they were focused on um, telemedicine, R&D processes, uh, especially drug recovery and clinical trial management, as well as the uh, fitness and wellness. Um, I guess the lots of uh, pandemic caused lots of anxiety for people and um, those uh, apps of uh, better sleep, uh, sleep health and uh, um, mind uh, management techniques. There's even a startup in Beaverton uh, that uh, is into that category. The um, so um, the digital health is going into um, that uh, mental health um, applications, which is um, good to see. Um, uh, here's a, a snapshot of um, a large um, a value, um, large startups that um, uh, the CB Insights is tracking off, and uh, some of the main ones, some of the front runners, were clinical intelligence and enablement. I think it was something like 17%, um, as well as um, screening diagnostics was the second place, uh, virtual care de delivery, and finally, disease management and therapeutics. So those are. Um, those were the main categories where um, investors um, uh, were splurging <laughs> uh, to enable um, to enable those sectors of uh, of the digital health 
uh, economy grow able to grow. So um, he's also the um, uh, latest, um, basically March 2021 quadrant, one of those magic quadrants from Gartner reports. And um, as you can see, some of the leaders in the in the field are um, IBM, Tipco so Software, Databricks, and uh, as well as um, Microsoft and Amazon Web Services and Google. Uh, there are also a few of um, other um, companies that created out of the, um, and I'll talk about them later, I'll talk about the, um, the collaborations that, um, that are done uh, with universities as well, and also big corporations in the fields of uh, even policy prevention and stuff. So, um, me uh, medical wearables also grew, uh, and the, the device market grew over 70 billion in 2019. And uh, a couple of years ago, the predictions were um, about. Um, 20 billion lower than um, it actually expanded. Um, in fact, um, those um, drivers that uh, I um, even talked about uh, a few years ago, uh, they're still a sh um, spearheading the growth and emergence of wearables. Those are the disease prevention and personalization of medical care. Um, the also emergence of wearables um, was spearheaded by COVID because uh, some even um, shifted uh, so much their attention uh, and got investments um, because they could predict those uh, various bias signs or um, uh, heart um, rhythms, uh, breathing and oxygen levels. Um, and that, um, that enabled them to improve and develop and get to market. Um, so in a way, um, I uh, revisited actually what I did for um, my uh, uh, defense and um, those wearable sensors, um, except for the Vitality one, uh, where um, because that one was sort of a concept and it's still in development, but uh, the others were able to uh, reposition themselves um, with um, and uh, get additional uh, funding because um, uh, all of the good um, sensors that they had uh, were um, val valuable for people um, that to uh, track COVID patients and. Um, they were really helpful um, and they were um, successful, still are. So um, with the focus on benefits to patients. Um, so goals of uh, medical uh, wearables is still in, the, in that uh, early diagnostics and personalization of care and medical adherence and cost savings. There are quite a bit of improvements that uh, we see in cost savings. And in fact, there are some studies uh, that show uh, that um, there are some uh, uh, benefits um, of uh, uh, medical wearables and adhering to, um, to those uh, by um, hospital uh, or uh, ambulatory care. Uh, so they, it's it's good to see that they are continuing to develop. Um, also, the um, AI engagement um, uh, has been growing in healthcare, and um, uh, again, the um, because of the hectic year, it actually had a very positive impact in uh, in growth of. Uh, AI sectors and um, manage, management of uh, very, uh, various diseases, uh, actually prediction of uh, um, hospitalization, um, predictions of um, uh, COVID um, 
hospitalization or just occurrences uh, and circles. Um, so those, those things have been um, on the growth and there has been um, a lot of um, uh, growth in publications as well in uh, uh, AI in the various uh, field in healthcare. And um, for example, like in risk evaluations um, on, on different viruses, whether there was um, respiratory viruses or other types and on different um, um, types of diseases, um, cardiovascular, diabetics, uh, and uh, everything that um, is uh, uh, that's influenced by that. So, um, so it has been a very good 2020 has been a good year in the AI development. In um, mitigation of diseases, um, there has been um, growth in um, uh, looking at uh, those, those diseases that are um, causing a lot of uh, costs in healthcare. So like uh, type two diabetes. Um, complications, um, uh, the, um, the septus um, uh, type of uh, uh, diseases. So um, in, to, uh, to sum it up in, um, in the literature, that has been a, quite a bit of growth. I don't have the, the graph that, that shows, but there is a lot of publications in uh, AI in healthcare. And uh, if um, anybody would guess, uh, but um, I was at the seminar um, on a webinar um, on uh, healthcare um, AI um, um, implementation of one company and uh, it was asked there, would you know how many actual publications were done in COVID uh, uh, implementation in AI? And uh, people uh, guessed, I guess, um, that there were, have been actually over 200 uh, published uh, research in uh, AI uh, towards uh, COVID. Um, so as I mentioned there has been AI in clinical research and uh, in bacteria and um, all of those things, if anybody is interesting, um, like for students, I can give uh, um, the, the list of, uh, um, of literature. Um, machine learning as well has been a very, um, um, a, a hot topic in uh, in uh, the uh, implementation of uh, of algorithms. So uh, there's certain things like um, um, labeled and unlabeled data, and um, uh, the types of data used uh, has been have been very important uh, in um, in in the algorithms and how how it gets uh, implemented that as well has been really uh, important in the integration for, uh, for healthcare. Um, this is just the, uh, the list of various um, machine learning algorithms that has been uh, frequently used in, uh, in healthcare schemes. So um, some of them, um, might be familiar. Uh, I will have a few um, clustering algorithms and um, um, some examples of logic uh, regression um, case, cases that we're going to look at. Uh, here's uh, some additional research that has been done in, um, um, in this field and um, for example, like uh, in Parkinson's disease, in uh, neural conectomics, in image recognition. And those, um, uh, the image recognition um, uh, topics are very um, 
interesting because uh, now they're into uh, getting it more for the radiology and actually um, expanding the field to have the predictive analytics added on uh, to just uh, the analysis that uh, is done with uh, uh, machine learning. Um, so AMSC organization um, published that um, that in the in healthcare transformations, um, the families and patients and communities uh, they are impacted the most, and uh, we have to look into into those when we are um, when we are changing the environments and and imp impacting it by adding um, healthcare analytics. So in the sense. Um, with the increasing health inequalities and in difficult uh, de deficits in coverage and attention, um, with growing public health crises, um, there's um, increased uh, demands on improved interoperability and um, um, and uh, access on EHR. So uh, that impacts uh, how. Um, AI um, gets implemented, how uh, data analytics uh, gets um, implemented in uh, healthcare. Uh, as well, I, um, there was a very interesting article um, and I even have the in communications of the ACM and um, uh, this, um, uh, this article showed the um, the ethical consideration uh, considerations in the fields of uh, accessibility and AI. Uh, what was uh, uh, interesting about it is that uh, when we develop technologies, when we use AI uh, for, um, as we think, um, to improve um, uh, healthcare, to um, provide um, prescriptive, uh, analytics to provide better treatments. Uh, we um, usually don't think um, that um, there might be um, ethical challenges that ethical considerations that um, uh, we haven't even um, discovered. So uh, for example, um, when uh, when people work on speech recognition. Um, uh, usually uh, that doesn't include people that have disabilities uh, and it's very difficult actually to uh, mimic those. So uh, um, sometimes, well, quite often the data that uh, is used as training data for AI is the data that um, uh, mimics the um, simulated data. Uh, and actually does not, um, um, is not this, the same data as the person uh, with certain disability and uh, speech disability would have. Um, there are a lot of um, ethical challenges, the uh, biases, um, the racial bias, uh, privacies, um, unreasonable expectations, those, those were sort of interesting because the, um, it's, um, it's a type of uh, uh, challenge where the, um, the technology is um, not quite there yet to the not, uh, doesn't have that level of the quality yet the, the expectations uh, are high. And uh, usually the, the people that are using it um, don't realize that it's not providing um, what, they, what they were looking for, what they need, um, as well as uh, um, certain um, errors that could um, come out of that. Um, the, the errors that might be okay for the people that uh, could understand them or see them uh, they're uh, not the same errors are, that are, for example, for a blind person uh, or for um, the errors 
uh, for people with other type of disability that could not distinguish those those type of errors. So it would be um, in the future, I think there are already uh, steps uh, taking that direction to uh, improve, um, to um, minimize the errors and, uh, uh, and have uh, more inclusive data sets and move away from the simulated da data sets um, if possible. Um, also the, um, Society of Actuaries is uh, publishing this uh, annual survey of um, health payer and provider executives. And um, uh, it's a yearly survey and I have the data. Um, they haven't published the data for, uh, for the 2020 survey, but it shows um, in which way the um, predictive analytics uh, is going. And um, the, what are the expectations of, uh, of those executives, um, the, the payer uh, from the pay and provider point of view in uh, predictive analytics. Uh, so uh, data visualization, as well as um, uh, securing data collection methods and uh, machine lear uh, learning and natural language processing are the, um, the top three um, expectations um, for predictive analytics and the challenges that they see for the future, uh, for the future five years are um, a lack of skilled employees, um, regulatory issues and um, problem with too much data, problem with incomplete data. Uh, I think that's, um, that's the thing that will be haunting um, predictive analytics all the time because data is always um, either too much data or incomplete data will be always uh, uh, persisting in healthcare industry. Um, so I already mentioned a bit of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, um, and uh, this is just um, sort of a small uh, summary um, what has been done. Um, there has been developments in AI, AI in tracking hospital capacity. And um, of course we've seen the accelerated drug discovery. Um, uh, identifying high-risk patients and uh, um, the, the those uh, patient uh, circles and uh, creating open access data. Uh, so with that, um, there has been lots of collaborations and partnerships, and that's actually great trends that we see in the industry because um, through um, partnerships of uh, uh, scientists and doctors and uh, um, AI um, data scientists, uh, it creates uh, quite good synergy and um, things actually happen and trust happens and um, good uh, uh, collaborative environment where um, um, it's not just uh, done in silos and done separately. So that's that's the future and it's good to see um, happening in the industry. Um, so uh, there's one of the cases I wanted uh, to share with you um, is a moving health home. Uh, that happened just recently on March 4th um, of 2021. And it's a coalition that um, um, there were some major stakeholders and um, Amazon is one of them, I think, um, that um, has been working to change the state, federal and state policy uh, to enable um, the care, um, home care, care from home. Um, so, um, Interestingly enough, um, the statistics um, is uh, quite uh, shocking because uh, it takes um, around 90,000 a year. Your slides. 
suddenly muted, Lydia. <laughs> That's bizarre. <laughs> There's technology for it. Um, so for how long? <laughs> it's um, 90,000 was the, the last thing we heard. Um, OK, so 90,000, um, around 90,000, a little bit more than $90,000 uh, is uh, an annual figure for taking care of the person in the nursing home. Now, if, uh, if that is done um, through the uh, home, um, health home uh, sort of uh, care, so where the person is at home getting the same adequate care, um, is uh, then the, the number is slashed to about 45,000, um, which is still high. Uh, <laughs> but it already is a 50% um, uh, improvement. So this coalition uh, is uh, working uh, to enable um, that um, um, the possibility of creating those health homes uh, for people um, about, I think there are other statistics and I don't want to um, about 70% of people um, who were asked whether they would want to be living in their home said that they were um, would be more interested in getting care at home than uh, their own home than in nursing home. And with the, the telehealth and with the um, remote patient monitoring, it is, it is very possible uh, to achieve that. So um, this is a very good trend and uh, it's, it's great that it's uh, signed on, you know, even such big um, players as Amazon uh, signed on and um, that those trends are gonna be continuing um, with the technology enabled virtual care. Um, so and hopefully it would improve cost and it would improve quality as well as uh, uh, reduce uh, hospital readmissions. Yeah. Let's see, For some reason it sort of, my computer sort of froze. <laughs> we see your slides forwarding. I know because it's uh, it's not quite moving how I want it to. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, so there's another case which was uh, very interesting to me uh, on uh, diagnostics of sepsis. Uh, so it's one of uh, those uh, terrible diseases that um, takes. Um, but thousands of people die each year from, and um, uh, one of those evasive uh, things that are difficult to diagnose, difficult to predict. Uh, and um, I'll show you a few cases. So there's one where Carnegie Mellon University uh, researchers, uh, they applied machine learning algorithms uh, to big data in EHR. So they took, um, all of those um, vitals and labs and medications uh, that attract an HR and they uh, try to create risk scores as well as uh, um, clustering. Um, so um, they had um, some uh, challenges. Um, they like uh, um, data cleaning, data fixing, uh, data validation, uh, and um, they didn't know um, since, the, since the disease doesn't have really uh, true patterns, um, what to, um, how to um, uh, start with it. But uh, since they, um, uh, they work together and uh, came up with the solution on um, uh, something that would bridge um, 
uh, visualization uh, and forecasting. So they both uh, used this uh, this tool to um, to um, in data ra uh, rounds in the hospital, and as well as in um, forecasting uh, for. Um, for prediction of uh, sepsis diagnosis in people. Um, another um, case was in Geisinger um, Health System. And uh, this one was an interesting one because they uh, actually, there were three researchers, um, mostly doctors, um, that um, decided to take on this issue, but they realized that they could not actually, they didn't have the capacity to tackle um, that big of a project. So they partnered with um, IBM uh, data science and analytics um, or AI elite, as they call themselves, team. Um, and um, uh, they came up with the, the used Watson Studio, the open source one, and they uh, came with the predictive model of sepsis mortality, that was one of the solutions they had. Um, so um, they um, got data from um, um, the like a dec decade data of uh, patients um, in sepsis, and then they uh, uh, did um, they um, created a model that uh, predicts immortality during the ninety days following the hospital stay. Um, so um, then they uh, try to personalize their um, uh, their results and um, figured some of the key factors that um, that were um, impacting um, um, the hospital readmissions with sepsis. The second solution that they had was done with Watson Explorer. And it was uh, basically a tool that sort of a bonus tool that they created for the doctors to, um, to look at the, um, the sepsis research. So in that way, they uh, created a tool that takes about um, 2 million medical journal papers um, and um, created a searchable index of medical publications and um, Hopefully, um, that would be used to monitor um, for preventative care in um, patient survival so doctors could review all of the latest and greatest in the research and um, present it to the patients and to, um, discuss um, treatments. Um, also, the um, it was an interesting case, on a recent case in predicting hospital readmissions was Atrios Health. And um, they tried to um, have an um, uh, observational study um, where they took uh, EHR data uh, as well as claims data. And they uh, trained the logistic regression model uh, predicting uh, hospitalizations of within six months. Uh, they then validated that model with a separate um, set of data and performed the sensitivity analysis with uh, both uh, EHR derived and claims derived data, as well as um, them together and separately. So uh, what that gave them, because um, um, EHR data uh, may not be complete as well as claims data, but uh, claims data could be uh, more accurate in some aspect. So uh, that's why they did that. And it uh, worked out great for them. And um, they got actually, um, well, if anybody is interested, the, um, the highest odds ratios for uh, readmissions were um, sickle cell anemia, uh, lipidosis and heart transplants, and also people aged uh, 76 years and more. So, um, uh, so the preventative care um, uh, analytics um, 
um, has uh, um, has been translating uh, data into the actionable pra practices. So after um, this is one of the um, uh, recent uh, trends in AI, and that's where um, it's important uh, for for that environment to be in is um, actually what is done after the model is uh, um, model is run and the people get results and how the model is used and whether it's used after some time and whether it's uh, um, actually translate into preventive care or in better care um, and whether it mitigates risks. Uh, so um, with the previous uh, cases, uh, it did uh, successfully uh, translate into the, those actionable uh, practices were uh, providing interve interventions to mitigate risks, um, talking to patients, um, calling them, visiting them. Uh, and um, there was a, a certain trust in the, uh, in the uh, those implementations uh, because um, uh, clinicians work very closely with data scientists. So uh, the, there was this uh, certain synergy and um, uh, trust that helped uh, um, the adoption of uh, those technologies and actually uh, worked on um, uh, translating it uh, into the um, preventative care. Um, so to, um, to some of the concerns in of the adoption of AI in healthcare, there were ethical concerns um, and uh, biases. And uh, of course, there's always, uh, there's a human bias. Uh, there's uh, AI bias and the data use bias. Um, anything can go uh, wrong with the, the health data. Uh, but uh, there's also a ways to, there's also ways to mitigate those biases and uh, reduce um, those uh, concerns. So the while the uh, barriers to adoption, especially uh, by um, providers, still uh, exist, um, and they are anxieties over data privacy, so security, the um, fears of uh, creating more complex or complicated care, care model or um, certain um, biases um, and depersonalizations of care delivery. There is still um, a good uh, thing in the industry for possible solutions uh, where um, the, if, um, if there's support that's provided to clinicians, uh, if, it's, if there are collaborations, uh, if there's a positive uh, change management environment that um, those um, data analytics innovations, they are received much better and they um, might have um, a better chance of staying as a, as a part of the healthcare delivery model. And, um, that um, the encouragement uh, to change the the culture of it uh, is uh, is actually um, one of the top aims in uh, data uh, analytics uh, implementations. Uh, so the um, the AI has a bright future and uh, it will continue to grow for um, diagnostics and treatment and for clinical research. Uh, we'll see more uh, investments in applications and wearables. Um, well, the, um, if uh, I understand that if uh, um, we won't need that much of the remote uh, um, healthcare uh, with the hopefully with the COVID pandemic subsiding, uh, we still will see the, those uh, uh, trends uh, for um, telemedicine. Um, and uh, one of the um, 
interesting points um, is that there are so many um, models that have been created um, that it would be uh, um, good to reuse some of the established models um, by um, that have been uh, done by so many um, um, collaborations and uh, by universities and uh, 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 data science establishments, and um, to have um, to to have those models uh, uh, reused and implemented uh, in other settings, and to uh, use the end-to-end um, -end AI platforms. Uh, which also improves um, um, prescriptive analytics. Um, so yesterday, yesterday I was um, at the uh, webinar for healthcare AI, and they um, um, they were showing their um, better prescriptive optimizations as they uh, say compared to other healthcare analytics. Uh, platforms. So that is one of the um, uh, streams that um, AI is going towards. And um, those are the, this is the future that um, will be in uh, AI adoption. Um, uh, also uh, for, for wearables, um, the growth in wearables will con continue to be dominant um, the, with the more um, advances in sensor precisions uh, in type of uh, um, uh, pro um, technologies used in materials, uh, as well as um, um, increased uh, interoperability with uh, electronic health records and um, other systems so that um, that could enable um, a higher use of uh, wearables that won't be um, just uh, silos or separate. Um, um, so that that is those are the future trends. And um, the end I would like to uh, show um, uh, this is uh, from the Frost and Sullivan report and um, those are the uh, key technological trends and uh, in healthcare. So uh, preventive healthcare technologies are going to be um, uh, trending as well as the um, implementation of uh, um, digital technologies for uh, real-time diagnostics, um, providing uh, care um, beyond hospital uh, just like um, in that um, uh, home um, uh, care um, advocacy group that has been uh, created for that. And um, uh, those are the, um, uh, the types of the, the trends in uh, healthcare um, technology that we will see um, improving and uh, developing. Um, in the near future. So in that, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Uh, and if you have any questions and comments, uh, I'll be happy to listen. Thank you, Lilia. I, I thought um, the Malut is, is probably managing the, the um, the questions, but I already found one in the chat. So somebody just asked, what are some ways that students could get involved in collaborative solutions? Oh, that students can get involved. Uh, there's actually um, a lot of uh, uh, platforms that uh, are allowing that, um, that um, like in the companies or just in the solutions, uh, because there's so many open source ones, just even that healthcare AI that um, would would give students an opportunity uh, to look at the models that have been already created or run their models uh, to download the data and download the training data and work on that themselves. Um, as far as uh, 
being able to be, uh, if they want to uh, be a part of um, some of the projects, I think they would have to look at the um, companies and the universities that are collaborating and get on those collaborations. Well, if there are um, additional questions, please. Um, yeah, I think there's there's one coming up here. How can health organizations, Providence, Pacific Source, the Oregon Health Authority, partner with academic organizations to test AI innovations? How can they test or? Yeah, how can how can they collaborate to part? How can they partner to to test AI innovations? Oh, um, I think that uh, the health uh, universities uh, actually they have uh, offices uh, of uh, um, where they for technology collaborations, uh, especially um, the uh, those. Um, um, healthcare, the hospitals are also called the teaching hospitals, university and the hospital. And um, there's, they are very open uh, to uh, various suggestions and collaborations. Um, in fact, I know because uh, um, how I was uh, volunteering at the OHSU during uh, of writing of my dissertation and um, they were very interested and open of uh, setting up uh, various uh, things if if students were interested. So, if, if I may add um, a question or a comment, and I'm I'm playing a little bit devil's advocate, but that usually makes for good good discussions. So I feel a lot of what you've presented, though I share the optimism, is very much technology push. People who like how to handle big data that say, hey, healthcare people, this is what you need. And when I realistically look even at some of the examples you've presented here, and I'm stepping in the shoes of a practitioner, I would say, well, a 76 year old with a heart transplant, yep, I expect that person to be back in the hospital. I do not need some fancy AI um, right. to, to give me that prediction. And, um, and now that you've trained that model, on all this wonderful data, now we need to add this had COVID or not before. And your entire model needs to be entirely retrained, completely useless. And how would this even fit into my everyday practice? I have one model for this one case. I have hundreds of patients that all have different diseases for which no model exists. How is any of that helping me in, in, in my practice? <laughs> oh yeah, that's a that's a very uh, good comment. Of uh, the um, well, uh, I think that um, that's one of the one of the issues uh, uh, of the AI and how they look at it. Um, well, the usually uh, certain things that I've seen and those uh, examples that I um, discussed, they um, those are sort of general. Um, uh, they're assigning risk scores to patients, and um, um, with a, and they can add data as well as uh, it's it's not just uh, yes it's it's trained on some data, but as data comes in, uh, the model has to be updated. Uh, so um, it's uh, if the if there are additional things about the. Uh, the person, it would change. But yes, um, how um, how it translates, it can, it, it does uh, show certain ballparks for some of those people. Um, the person that had a heart attack or heart transplant, uh, they will have a higher risk. Uh, they will have that, um, the doctors, I guess, yes, maybe no brainer, but uh, it may, uh, help um, to keep the person out of the hospital with the, uh, if they uh, get monitored better, if they, um, if there's a certain uh, regime or um, certain practices that could be in place uh, for that person. I mean, my, my uh, grandmother had a heart condition and, um, and so was my grandpa, but, um, they, um, and she had a couple of heart attacks, but she hasn't, you know, during her lifetime, she didn't spend that much time at the hospital. 
um, mostly because um, she was very closely mo monitored by her primary care physician. And she had that, um, um, she, she got um, uh, home visits and she had the, the right um, medication. And, and if that type of monitoring, I think, um, uh, is helpful. And if AI could provide at least suggestion that some um, populations, some um, at-risk um, groups of people need that closer uh, monitoring so they would not end up uh, in the hospital that, that frequently, then it's worth it, I think. Yeah. I think there's another um, question in the chat. Have you encountered the idea of describing a complete hospital nursing home model post-COVID with efficient infrastructure, including remote monitoring treatment, cutting down physical costs, such as parking, parking spaces. Life post-COVID lifestyle may match the same lifestyle as during COVID due to patients' low confidence levels. So um, yeah, it sounds like the person <laughs> looked up maybe a certain, uh, that type of model or, um, um, I don't know, maybe I didn't understand the, the question uh, correctly, whether I've encountered something that, uh, that's uh, that uh, uh, sophisticated of a model that would provide well, all of that. I mean, Adnan, do you wanna um, unmute? I think that's, that was yours, right? It, it reads to me as if it's the question, well, can we think of a different healthcare delivery model post COVID where we right. might actually save some costs by doing some things more remotely needing less parking spaces because Odds are people are not comfortable coming back into yeah. healthcare settings at the same rate than before COVID. Yes, actually, yeah. thank you so much for uh, phrasing it that way, uh, Dr. Uh, Yeder. Um, um, yeah, my, my intention was more to understand, uh, you know, just with your extensive experience and through uh, the research that you had, uh, you know, put together, uh, which is really great. Thank you uh, for sharing is that is there a golden recipe of a certain model? And I didn't really look for it yet, but I was just kind of wondering about it. A golden recipe to the point where, you know, reflecting on the future, uh, how the hospitals will be, uh, if you're gonna be establishing a hospital from scratch, for example, um, you know, the, 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 the operation within the hospital is gonna be changing considering, you know, the new technologies that's gonna be part of it, like for example, AI and machine learnings. Uh, so that's, that's sort of things that, that's, uh, that's what I meant in a way. I hope that that's clear, sorry, thank you. All right, yeah, um, you know, there, there are a lot of good models and um, there's a lot of good policies and good good writing and all of that uh, you know when whenever um, you read something from the uh, association of uh, uh, medical um, um, medical uh, institutions and medical hospitals with the uh, with the various um, healthcare organizations they all um, and researchers they they all have uh, um, a good uh, good ways to describe it on paper uh, but that doesn't translate that well into practice and it's one of the issues um, in uh, uh, in healthcare uh, where no matter how much of the analytics you would provide and how much how good that the model would be and what it would say that you should be doing um, sometimes the due to, to policies uh, uh, factors uh, you know social political environmental um, economic ones, um, they will not necessarily translate um, into the actionable um, results. And um, they, yes, there have been really good models and uh, for COVID and for, for, other, for other disease prevention, but it's also about what can be implemented and how, and sometimes uh, there are um, strong barriers or how things could be done because the, of the complexities of healthcare industry and, um, and the inflexibility. And just last week we had the seminar right on 
that was talked about interoperability. And uh, I actually watched a lot of Judy Faulkner and uh, what, how she um, portrays Epic and how it's done. But, um, but in reality, um, there's uh, a lot of um, this uh, resistance uh, to full uh, level of interoperability and actually um, the good implementation. So. So, so here's another comment, and I think that's directly towards my joke. If somebody's 76 and has a hard time to find readmission as a given, what do you need a model for? And so <laughs> this person says, I worked in clinical analytics and quality assurance, and, and actually reducing healthcare readmission is a massive focus and a really, really big problem that they need more insights in. And so he says, or she says, for example, the majority of 30-day readmissions come on day one. So there was ample room for improvement. And the higher ups were already looking for and considering data driven tools to improve on the existing systems. Yeah. So, so very much in, in favor of what you've laid out as, as applications of machine learning, AI, data science yeah. to improve medical care. Yeah, because mo you can model all kinds of stuff, but uh, how it's implemented and whether it's implemented and what exactly, whether there's um, resources to implement it, whether they're um, also the right climate, whether it's political climate or that's, yeah. So may maybe a question, If are you aware of any research that looks at um, COVID fatality and things like hospital capacity and how long people get to stay. Because my, my impression is most industrialized countries let patients stay in the hospital simply longer so that this real issue of readmission is less of an issue. And this whole desire to monitor as home is also less of an issue because you're monitored in the hospital. Right. Um, and so I think we have a very distinct, very technology focused debate in this country that has a lot to do with what our healthcare cost structures look like. So have you come across any data now that we have the same, the same disease all over the globe <laughs> with shockingly different mortality outcomes in, in, in different countries? Are you aware of any big data projects that, that would look at, at this question at maybe even a global scale so that we get out of the, the local realities that, that factor into all these insights? Oh, um on the hospital, particularly hospital readmissions, and uh, um, the well, the there are a few. Um, I think there was one um, either out of the MIT University. I can uh, I can send you uh, some of uh, them because I have like libraries of uh, various. Um, um, articles and yeah. from, from Joe's the one that are published there's some that are um, you know, just uh, published uh, online or just ongoing and they will be publishing later but yes I think that's uh, that's uh, number almost number one um, um, issue a problem uh, for some reason <laughs> uh, yeah the hospital readmissions um, in the United States is a, is a really sought after problem. So pretty much every medical uh, large uh, um, hospital university has been looking into that problem and how to solve it. And they uh, partnered um, with various companies just like the one that I described with, uh, with IBM and with, the, with Amazon, some partnered with Google. Uh, as well, there's quite a bit of partnerships there, um, and that. But um, yeah, um, it's uh, it's because the hospital stay is so expensive in the United States compared to other countries. Um, I think the um, healthcare in in the U.S. is much more expensive. I think there's uh, twenty. Uh, the cost for a family of four is um, about $28,000 a year for just a regular family of four in the United States. Um, so, and for a person is around 10,000 for one person. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe some, some good data analytics and AI show us where the, where the true pain points are. And maybe we also need to, in addition to 
building data systems that guide decisions better also built actual on the ground infrastructure like yes. hospital beds or, yes. or community care nurses um, to, to improve the situation. And I think that your, your work can certainly help um, identify those leverage points too. I agree, yeah. Thank you. So I think we're, we're almost in, in overtime. Um, probably have time for one more question if somebody has a pressing question or comment. If not, I would like to thank you for a really engaging thank talk. You. Thank you so much. Um, I think several people who are on the call today are looking forward to having you an engineering econ in, in a oh, few well, Yes, that, that should be fun. And uh, you know, I'm looking forward uh, to that to that yeah. class. And uh, maybe we will look at uh, even various uh, companies, maybe even healthcare companies or uh, the that we could uh, analyze and look at their uh, data sheets at the look at the discount cash flow analysis and um, well you know if someone wants to have also a project uh, in you know doing machine learning it's uh, I can't say no if, if that's uh, because it's a part of the engineering economics it's just yeah. you know you can use uh, those are novel methods so you can <laughs> I'll be open if students uh, want to do project in that space. Great. But, uh, cool. Thanks again also for, uh, for a great talk. I enjoyed it. And I think the uh, people next term will be quite lucky. I mean, you've got uh, a great background in engineering economics. Your master's thesis even used engineering economics to examine different uh, forest uh, product companies and practices. Yeah, yeah at, I, I also Idaho. did that yeah. in, um, uh, for, yeah, you said forest product. Um, I did that for uh, my job when I was uh, working as an analyst for the uh, forest products consulting company um, before I joined uh, PSU. So uh, I analyzed with discounting cash flow analysis. I analyzed a lot of, um, well, Crown Pacific and Georgia Pacific and Plum Creek and some of the large uh, and some of the and some of the small ones like Mount Angel Abbey, uh, <laughs> where the monks have they they <laughs> they have forests that need to be managed for the monastery and um we were using discounted cash flow analysis uh for their investment so that sounds like fun and very real world projects for your class thank you so much <laughs> Lilia. Right. Thank, thank you thank okay. you for everybody who wants to earn credit for this class and still has some some questions about it i'll stay on the call for a little longer um, and for everybody else, thank you for joining us in this speaker series. Um, it was great to have all of you here. Thank you to our speakers, and we will see you next term. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.